Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonard Rubenstein. I'm the uh, coordinator of the uh, USIP Working Group on Peace Building and Health. And I'd also like to welcome everyone who is watching by webcast. Uh, this is a new working group here at USIP uh, established to look at key issues around the intersection of health programs and health policy and peacemaking and peace building. This is the second of our uh, meetings, and uh, the, the um, interest in this topic was so great that it doesn't feel too much like a working group today, more like a, a formal presentation. Uh, we will in the future have more around the table kind of discussions. And the next discussion will be on the role of the health sector in addressing gender-based violence, and that should be in February. Today, of course, we're talking about health programs and health policy in Afghanistan. And in, in a very appropriate kind of introduction to this topic, uh, the Secretary of State this, this week gave a speech on development. And in her speech, uh, Secretary Clinton had this to say, we are working to elevate development and integrate it more closely with defense and diplomacy in the field. Development must become an equal pillar of our foreign policy alongside defense and diplomacy led by a, a robust and reinvigorated AID. She went on to say, quote, now I know the word integration sets off alarm bells in some people's heads. There is a concern that integrating development means diluting it or politicizing it, giving up our long-term development goals to, a sh to achieve short-term objectives or handing over more of the work of development to our diplomats or defense experts. That is not what we mean, nor what we will do. What we will do is leverage the expertise of our diplomats and our military on behalf of development and vice versa. The three Ds must be mutually reinforcing." Close quote. Though Secretary Clinton was seeking to reassure, her answer really raises as many questions as it solves. What does mutual reinforcement mean in policy and in practical programmatic terms? And what does it mean to leverage the military on behalf of development? And what does it mean to leverage development on behalf of military goals? Nowhere are these questions more acutely posed than in Afghanistan. On the one hand, the U.S. has invested heavily and with some success in the development of a national primary health care system with Afghan leadership. At the same time, the military has been engaged in many health-related activities. And now the USAID director has stated that the goal of the program in Afghanistan is to support the building of capacity locally at the same time, USAID projects must, quote, demonstrate how the proposed activity contributes to U.S. counterinsurgency goals, close quote. These are the questions our wonderful panel will answer. All of them have great experience in this field and in Afghanistan. In USIP tradition, I won't give full biographies, but I'll just briefly uh, discuss who they are and the order in which they'll speak. We'll start with Dr. Bill Newbrander, who has spent years as a senior advisor to the Ministry of Public Health in Afghanistan, and he's off for another two-month stint next week, so we appreciate him being here. Then we'll hear from Dr. Warner Anderson, who has had a distinguished career in civilian and military medicine, has served in Iraq, and is now Director of International Health in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Then we'll hear from Dr. Ann Peterson, who in a previous life uh, was Assistant Administrator of USID at the very time that global health spending was expanding dramatically, and she was, of course, in charge of global health. And she has also uh, spent a great deal of time doing evaluations of health programs in Afghanistan. And finally, uh, we're privileged to have Sepadek Habanshad, who is a career foreign service officer with many years of experience in Afghanistan and 
who was brought by Ambassador Holbrook to work as a senior development advisor on his staff. So each of the speakers will speak for uh, 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So we'll start with Bill. I guess I'm going to do a little bit of the uh, retrospective of just trying to uh, talk a little bit of um, where we were and where we um, are uh, at this point. Um, uh, so, uh, and then um, talking a little bit about what um, what would be some of the reasons for the su success that uh, that we've seen in the health sector in Afghanistan, uh, some of the really remarkable. Um, successes that there have been, and then looking um, to what are some of the challenges uh, for the future, both uh, uh, directly for um, MOPH in terms of the continued uh, development and extension of its health system, uh, as well as uh, uh, some of the challenges under the uh, current situation with the um, uh, need for the uh, uh, counterinsurgency uh, with the um, uh, concerning uh, the, the Taliban. So those will be the uh, things I hope to cover here very quickly. Um, just for making a comparison between 2002, um, when um, uh, USAID initiated some uh, activities in health in, in Afghanistan in early 2002, uh, and compared to 2009, um, uh, WHO has come up with uh, what they call six building blocks for a um, good health system. And these range from, what you might expect, certainly a good health service delivery, uh, to the, the workforce, a good information system so you know what you're doing or what you aren't doing, um, good uh, drugs for um, delivering of services, and then uh, financing, and then effective leadership and governance. And um, I'll just put this up in terms of uh, why are those the six building blocks, the fuller model that WHO um, has, uh, has is that uh, with those six building blocks, that helps to uh, increase uh, access and coverage, uh, hopefully with improved quality and uh, safety of the health services, and the ultimate results which, uh, and outcomes that hopefully uh, you're getting from that are improved health, a res uh, health system that's responsive to the population, uh, better efficiency, and really uh, reducing any um, uh, financial or social risk that uh, different elements or ethnic groups of the population might have. Just looking quickly at 2002, I'll just cover this quickly and then go into these uh, shortly to say what have been some of the achievements and gaps. Um, uh, I guess it would have been easy probably to just say F for everything because there wasn't much there um, in early 2002 when we got started. <laughs> but uh, uh, I guess health service delivery, I said D minus, uh, it was pretty bleak. Uh, we think only about 5% of the population had any access to health care, mainly those in uh, some of the urban areas, but uh, probably was not uh, available for, for women. Um, you did have a few of the NGOs that had been there through all those years of war and were still delivering some health services. So uh, there was a bit that was uh, there, uh, but really not much related to uh, child health interventions or, or um, maternal interventions, which were uh, a real s need there. As far as the workforce, many of the uh, professionals, as far as the physicians and top uh, uh, people in the uh, health sector had left over the years to Europe, North America, um, other countries uh, during the old, those years of war. You still had some, um, as I said, the NGOs doing some training of health workers, but uh, there were no standards, no standard treatment protocols. Um, what uh, one NGO called a community health worker, uh, another um, called a community health worker, was, but it was more of uh, maybe just a health educator or that. So. Uh, there wasn't much there as far as the workforce. The information system, again, I gave it a D minus. They, they were reporting. They had everything down on one sheet, but it really didn't cover uh, some of the critical areas. Only about 5% of the known facilities were even reporting, so, uh, and it really missed the MCH issues. Um, then hardly any drugs. The few they had uh, coming across from Pakistan or Iran, uh, no real uh, system of health financing, and certainly um, during, even though there was a Ministry of Health during the Taliban times, uh, there was really no leadership or governance. Um, it was more of a um, still part of the uh, political establishment of who was complying and who wasn't, as opposed to uh, actually getting health services out there. 
So I'll just cover each of those six building blocks uh, quickly as far as what we've seen. Um, uh, Ryan, I'm, it's not advancing for me. Do I need to do something else? Or? Left click. Yeah, there we go. Got it. Okay. Um, so, uh, and these I'm not going to cover in detail. You've seen that, and I have a couple slides, but certainly you've heard about the, um, you know, the 25 percent reduction in infant and um, under five child mortality. Uh, there's been certainly increased access to health services. If you've heard Dr. Fatimi, the ministry uh, says that it's about uh, 83, 84, 85 percent have access to services now. And there's certainly been a large improvement in ma maternal care. We've not been able to get a um, maternal mortality rate, another fix on it, uh, but that was the, what was done by uh, CDC and um, uh, UNICEF in, uh, I believe it was 2002 or 2003, uh, that really gave us the, the baseline of how bad it was as far as uh, maternal mortality. But, uh, but that's really been improved with, uh, as we'll cover some of the other in terms of uh, uh, the services available and the midwives that have been trained. Some of the gaps that are still there that, um, so I'm covering a little bit of what we still see right now as far as some of the gaps. Um, the ministry still really needs to um, focus a, a whole lot more on uh, community-based uh, health components. And um, this was uh, somewhat of a push. Uh, certainly USAID has certainly been emphasizing it, um, a bit less by some of the other donors, but a, a real need. And uh, it certainly uh, has come up as a big item in counterinsurgency. But even if you didn't have that as an issue, uh, the, you really needed a much stronger community-based element because that's how you're really going to extend access to that last 15% uh, where it's uh, extremely difficult uh, as well as uh, trying to start improving some of the quality. Um, most of that access problem uh, is due to geography or uh, certainly now uh, security has been a, a, an issue too. I'm just going to show two quick ones here uh, as far as access. This uh, first graph um, uh, is from 2003 and it shows uh, by district the population per health facility, whether that be a basic health center, comprehensive health center, or a district hospital. Um, the darker shades of red are bad, meaning that it's a much higher population per facility, um, and the lighter color or shades of red or pink are uh, good. So this is 2003, and if you contrast that with uh, 2008, you see that um, we're going to a lot more um, light shading. Uh, there, the number of dark uh, areas are, are much less. So the overall access has uh, increased. Um, you have a lot fewer districts that don't have the required number of health facilities uh, given their population. Uh, and these tend to be, as I said earlier, mainly in the insecure and the uh, areas as well as very uh, difficult geographical areas. Wanted to just show a little bit in terms of um, people making use of those services. Uh, the one in the upper left corner is talking about total uh, patient visits at um, uh, per month, um, uh, average over a year. Um, starting with 2004 going up to 2007, and this is for all the uh, clinics um, and uh, hospitals in USAID-funded provinces, uh, the 13 provinces that USAID had undertaken a commitment for, uh, European Commission and World Bank had uh, taken responsibility for the others. They had worked together quite well in, in taking different responsibilities. The upper uh, right-hand one is the number of monthly um, deliveries at health facilities, and then the bottom one is, uh, talks of um, uh, family planning um, services that have been provided. In the upper left and the lower uh, graph, uh, the, uh, it's very hard to see. There's a yellow line here, which is basically adding up uh, what you have in terms of uh, the dark blue being services <coughs> provided at fa health facilities, those being clinics, and the pink being <laughs> at um, health posts, which are out in the communities and services provided by community health workers. And the yellow is just simply additive. What I wanted to highlight, you can see that it's been a significant trend from 2004. It goes all the way up to 2007. I'm sure it's difficult to read back there. Um, uh, I wasn't clever enough with, I didn't have the background uh, spreadsheet, but I do have the 2008 figures, and there's been a, even a further uh, huge um, increase. Um, as far as uh, clinic health services, this is actually um, for services at um, both uh, health posts and clinics. That's jumped up to um, over 1.3 million per month, um, which is just phenomenal. Uh, 
hard to see this grid, but we started at about 150,000 by 2007. We thought we were doing, uh, it was pretty good with uh, up to about 750,000 per month. Uh, but now um, it's, uh, it really uh, w ramped up in 2008. Part of that might have been the ministry uh, took a policy that there would no longer be any uh, user fees. And so there was a great uh, deal of increased demand as well. I think the other significant thing is that if you look at the number of deliveries, uh, really that's very significant as far as um, impact on maternal mortality. Um, again, we started with about 800 per month um, in 2004 which equates to about 30 deliveries a day in health facilities in these 13 USAID-funded provinces. Um, by, uh, in this graph here, by 2007, it had been up to uh, a little over 5,000 a month. Uh, in 2008, it's uh, um, up to uh, 13,774 um, per month. That's the average over those 12 months. So you're going, so we went from about 30 deliveries per day at, uh, in these USAID-funded provinces to over 460 a day. So that's uh, sig really significant, and that's why I say when we do have an MMR, um, all of what um, USAID and the others have put into the health sector, uh, we will see a significant drop in that. <coughs> uh, just trying to go back here, Ryan. <laughs> Um, on the uh, health, uh, again, uh, the women health issues and thus the, the children as well were the real uh, target uh, starting in 2002 of not just USAID but the other donors as well because that was where the need was. Just showing a couple of the things here that, um, uh, as I said, access, even if you have uh, increased the number of clinics, as we saw in one of the uh, earlier slides, if you don't have female health workers at those clinics, most of the uh, women, especially in the rural areas and the more conservative areas, uh, are not going to be able to have access. Uh, the, their um, uh, husbands or families just will not let them be seen by uh, male health workers. Uh, so, um, and we had that whole black hole of the Taliban years when there was no education of women. Uh, so you were really swimming upstream starting in 2002. But uh, the number of health facilities with at least one female health worker has increased from 21% uh, uh, back uh, five, six years ago to about 83% now. The other significant thing, I said we really have to focus on the community-based health care, and the community health workers are the core part of that. Again, if you train a lot of community health workers, but they're mainly males uh, because they can travel a lot more and they're not paired up with uh, a female relative, whether that be uh, a wife or a sister or something, um, again, you're not going to be reaching a lot of the female um, population that uh, need health services. And that, with the number of CHWs that have been trained, has gotten so that we actually have uh, slightly more female CHWs than we do males. It's about a 51-49. Uh, the weaknesses as far as with um, health workers is really uh, the supervision and uh, what I also put there in terms of continuing education and really uh, monitoring more closely the quality of uh, care that they are providing. <coughs> um, as far as a function management system, you really need that for being able to figure out what's going on or what's not going right. Um, Again, in the USAID-funded provinces, uh, it hasn't been quite as strong in the other provinces, but over 95% of the health facilities are reporting. So when I give you that, those figures that I just gave you as far as increased health services, uh, those are really good figures. Uh, you know, they have, they'd have very strong confidence intervals in terms of uh, being able to report. They're not just uh, 10 facilities and we're extrapolating. Um, one other part that I didn't mention here is that uh, as far as human resources, um, and really figuring out what do they have available to them, uh, that's part of the HMIS. Uh, we now have that uh, the human resource database that um, uh, USAID, uh, with its um, health work there, helps, uh, helped us to get going about uh, 2004. It now contains about 90% of all the health workers are, uh, are listed on this database. We know where they're at, uh, what their skills are, how recently they've been trained and uh, we're including all of the CHWs now, so it's gonna be quite a comprehensive one. But um, I think one of the issues with that information, it's mainly at the central level, uh, 
we need more needs to be done to really push it down more at the provincial and community levels, not just so they have the information, but they use it. And as I'll tell you later about, uh, I think one of the needs is really a much stronger decentralization. So, uh, so there's more um, uh, planning and uh, taking of action at the local level based on local needs. Uh, pharmaceuticals, this has been a very strong point. Um, it wasn't part of anybody's plan back in uh, 2003 as the different uh, donors um, took responsibility for these different provinces and provided grants to NGOs to provide services. And uh, it was USA that just said, oh, you know, there's nothing there for drugs. So we started in, a, in the uh, USA funded provinces um, uh, uh, a very sound uh, system for getting drugs out there to these facilities. And at this point, it's over $5 million a year that's going out there. And the, it's been so um, uh, good and strong and, and a key part of raising care that the uh, ministry is really pushing very hard for the World Bank and uh, EC so that this is a national uh, way of doing it as opposed to uh, only for the USAID funded provinces. Um, again, uh, really a need for standard treatment guidelines that can help make sure that we not only have drugs out there but they're used appropriately, that there's good compliance and um, uh, so that's uh, one of the needs uh, for the future. As far as financing, uh, it's been great, mainly because the donors have been providing it. Um, uh, the donors have really uh, stepped forward over these years as far as uh, providing the money so services can be expanded. And um, the ministry has uh, seen the need, but as I mentioned in some of the weaknesses, they've often talked about sustainability and um, uh, what they can do as far as health financing, but they're really um, only starting to do some real significant planning in that area uh, now. Uh, it's only been recently. Uh, that they've been doing it. And maybe part of that's because um, there hasn't been a critical need in the sense that they've had uh, a good amount of resources for what needed to be done. The last building block as far as uh, leadership and uh, governance, um, just uh, once again, I think uh, the real achievements, um, the ministry having the basic package of health services, this tells what uh, health services are critical for maternal health, child health, infectious diseases, uh, communicable diseases, um, and uh, as well as uh, mental health and uh, rehabilitation services. It uh, describes uh, what you need to have at, a, at each level of the health system, basic health center, comprehensive health center, district hospitals, what kind of people you need, uh, what drugs you need there, uh, which ones are appropriate from the essential drug list, and so it's uh, really pretty much of a how-to, and with them establishing this in 2003, it really set the priorities that they had, focusing especially on women and children, uh, but also on mortality reduction, and it also uh, helped them to, as other background noise or static came as far as you should be doing this, you should be doing that, it really helped them to stay focused. Um, and so that, as well as then the companion one that came out a little later, the essential package of hospital services have really been kind of uh, very important for guiding. Um, one other key part about governance is that the uh, U.S. Uh, signed an agreement with the Afghan government um, uh, over a year ago in 2008 of uh, committing to provide uh, funding for the basic package of health services over the next uh, three to five years and having that channel through the Afghan government. Uh, with the appropriate monitoring in that. So instead of passing through uh, one of the U.S. Um, entities, uh, it uh, is going directly to the government, and so that's quite significant. Uh, I think it might even be the first time um, possibly in the world that that has been done in, in a, a country where USAID is uh, working. As far as the um, gaps of that, um, I think uh, with a lot of the success um, uh, that there's been some loss of focus on mortality reduction. You know, we've reduced the number of um, infant and under five child deaths, and that's been, uh, that's good, that's gratifying, uh, but you still have close to 600 kids a day that are uh, dying from uh, causes that really uh, can be prevented or that they're uh, with appropriate recognition and early treatment. Uh, there's no need for them to uh, uh, be dying. So, um, so uh, as far as just then for 2009, um, I won't go in detail on this. Uh, I think you can see, uh, and again, this is Bill Newbrander's report card. Uh, it's not an official report card, so it's my assessment, um, having been there over the, both those periods. But uh, I think you can see that there's been some real significant gains. There's still some areas, such as health financing, that uh, really need some strengthening there. 
let me just talk a little bit of why do I think uh, th that there's been some of these successes uh, that have happened with the ministry due to USAID support and uh, being a partner with the Ministry of Health. First of all is certainly they had those clear priorities and I, the basic package did that. Uh, certainly saving lives was a priority and um, having those, that basic package really has made all the difference in terms of uh, getting the right things done at the right time uh, over these years. I think the second thing I would like to just mention certainly, and I think it's the, actually the untold story about Afghanistan and what USAID has done there, and that's capacity building. Uh, the ambassador's letter in, two, in August of 2009 um, that uh, he sent out to everybody that said we're going to do Afghanization. And he was talking about everything that, uh, that the U.S. is involved with, uh, whether it be um, certainly from the military, but certainly in the uh, aid sector. Um, and uh, I think I'd have to say, at least my assessment would be that, you know, that USAID could actually say, been there, done that, because in the health sector, because they've done a significant amount. And the capacity development has been across the board. There's been clinical, as I say, there's been this uh, huge increase because of um, USAID helping them to establish these uh, midwifery schools, and then later a new cadre because of this gap in education of community midwives, which um, allowed a greater number to be trained um, out in more of the rural areas uh, for providing um, um, attended births uh, in these villages. But it's also been in management and uh, in certainly financial management as well in terms of the ministry being uh, the grants and contracts management unit of the ministry now being certified by the U.S. government to receive funds. Um, why? Uh, what, what made the difference in capacity building? I think there's three or four things. One, um, in those early years, uh, experienced people were put on the ground. These are people that had experience in other developing countries um, that had significant um, uh, uh, expertise in those areas of uh, building a, a developing country health system. They were there for extended periods. It wasn't just two-week visits and then they'd be back uh, six months later that they were living there and on the ground to make it happen. Uh, these were people that rolled up their sleeves and were working and mentoring uh, the Afghans, working in their offices and uh, really making a difference uh, in terms of that. Okay. Um, the um, I think one other factor is they work not only on the public sector, but the uh, private sector. And finally, uh, the donors, uh, certainly USAID and EC and World Banks, aligned with the ministry's priorities. Um, the challenges for the future, I'm not going to uh, go over them again. I think they came out in some of the gaps and challenges that I uh, covered uh, earlier. The one I'll just point out, uh, uh, looks like Dr. Fatimi, uh, who's been the minister for the past five years. He was the second minister. Um, was not um, uh, approved by Parliament last week, and so a new slate of um, proposed ministers is going to be proposed, I believe, by President Karzai uh, tomorrow. And so, uh, and that, but that's true for any developing country. Whenever there's a change of leadership, it's always um, we adjust. We work with whoever's there, and uh, so uh, and um, working with them. Let me just cover the last two things as far as. Um, <coughs> challenges with uh, the counterinsurgency. I think the first point, um, uh, in case there's any doubt of anybody, the military is necessary. Um, if uh, if uh, the Taliban were allowed to be there uh, without um, um, basically, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, terrorists running around, you really wouldn't have any sort of development in the country. You'd, you'd have uh, chaos and uh, anarchy. And so, uh, the military is necessary for health development to go forward as well as other sectors. Second thing, um, USAID, um, uh, just uh, these are again my, my thoughts on, on uh, going forward with USAID. Certainly, uh, and they've been doing this, so I'm not saying that this is contrary to what they're doing, but where we've had good results, which in many of the provinces that have been for the most part secure, to maintain that and continuing to do that, and USAID is doing that. They're not turning away from them and saying, well, we'll shift to the uh, east and south. Uh, secondly is uh, further capacity building, because that's where you're going to have the long-term results. Um, to, so continue to do that. And finally, um, uh, really uh, looking for the effective ways that we can work in these insecure provinces in an effective way, but a, an appropriate way. Um, the last thing that I have on this slide is just mentioning that um, I'm, at times we only talk about financial resources. Are we diverting finances? Uh, away from these areas to another. 
Um, I think uh, more of a concern is the finances, uh, which hasn't been an issue so far, uh, but uh, is a concern about whether that could be the case in the future. But I think it's uh, the attention uh, that's given, that if we divert attention and uh, energy um, to other areas and not continue the work that's been started in uh, the more secure areas, then we ha run a real risk of, uh, of sliding backwards somewhat. Um, last thing as far as uh, certainly some views in terms of um, for the military, I guess uh, uh, for the uh, PRTs and that that are involved, uh, uh, maybe involved in health development, uh, I guess I've basically said that uh, they have a role where we can take advantage of their comparative advantage. The military is very good. Um, I was a medical company commander. We're very good on, on systems. And uh, so one of the things I've indicated there is uh, that, um, you know, it's things such as medical maintenance. Um, that's always an issue in, in developing countries. And, so, and the military has a very good system for that, uh, for maintaining medical equipment, repairing it, uh, having parts, uh, having a training facility for um, making those um, uh, so that the goods work because as we often hear, not just in Afghanistan, donors come in, give equipment, and after uh, the first time it uh, breaks or there's a part that uh, uh, goes or a bulb that goes or you don't have the reagents, suddenly it's in the hallway and not used anymore. So uh, that, um, they do have resources and so for capital projects that uh, need to be done, uh, clinics, um, elements to that are rehabilitation. In Herat, uh, I think they bought a, a fair number of ambulances, so those can be quite good. Um, I think where there's real issues, um, uh, and we've seen some of this uh, at times in the past, not just in the most recent with the counterinsurgency, is, is when um, the uh, involvement with the military in terms of health uh, affairs um, are, are not coordinated adequately with the Ministry of Health or they're not uh, public health or not uh, fully aligned with their priorities um, or just taking unilater unilateral action. Um, I think probably the worst example we remember was that, uh, this is a number of years ago, probably about four or five, of where one of the units really well-intentioned, but they got a bunch of vaccine and went out and provided immunizations to a bunch of kids in that without any uh, knowing if there had been any done before. They had not coordinated with the provincial health officer. Uh, they didn't know what had been gone on before. so. Uh, it, they just went out to uh, undertake that. Now that's an extreme example, that's not the norm, so I'm not trying to portray that as it, but, uh, um, and I think the last thing that I've mentioned here, there is a real risk as far as the NGOs that, and this is, um, you know, one of the real challenges of, of how providing aid and yet uh, the NGOs that are out there day to day running those clinics and providing the services, uh, how can they not be, uh, have the, appearance or, or uh, certainly the perception that they're closely aligned with the military because uh, they, there can be revenge to them and their staff as well as uh, communities if there is that uh, concern in those areas that, that are not uh, uh, fully held at this point. So, Thank so you. I guess I'll conclude. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Bill. You. We'll uh, hold questions and comments until the end. Uh, we've heard the civilian perspective, now the military perspective. Thanks a lot. I'm bringing my water here because I'm in the middle of a sore throat and a cold right now. So Murphy's Law says that uh, any uh, exacerbation of my illness will occur while I'm at the podium. <laughs> so uh, I learned that in medical school. Um, <clears throat> first of all, it's a, uh, it's a great honor, but it's also a humbling experience to be here uh, among people that I have a lot of respect for in this field. Um, I actually was carrying around with me a picture, with a paper which might look familiar to you. Um, it's by uh, Len Rivenstein, and it, I have uh, read it and made uh, lots of writings in it in my internal dialogue with it, many of which I can't read. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, uh, it, it's uh, very provocative, and although I don't agree with everything in it, it uh, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to stimulate discussion and, and thought. And also, uh, Jean Bonventry is in the back, uh, my greetings to Jean. And I have here the, the draft, which I've also written all over, and I, I need to deliver this to you later, but I've learned a lot from Jean, too, and I've learned a lot from, from lots of folks in the, in the room, and, and uh, I'm really happy to, to see you here today. And I'm going to try to finish this in about 15 minutes, okay. if I can. Yeah. Um, 
and just click the mouse to make the slides go. <coughs> okay, uh, the reason I'm, I'm here today, first of all, thanks for inviting me. The reason I accepted the invitation is not so I could come and tell you what I think, but so that when I'm done telling you what, what I think and what my division thinks, I can hear what you think because that's much more important to me. Um, as, I've, as I've alluded, uh, you are the, the experts, you are the interested parties. Many of you have, have more time in Iraq than I do, many of you have more time, everybody's got as much or more time in Afghanistan than I, I have a week there. Um, so I, I don't come to you as an expert on Afghanistan. The International Health Division was stood up to look at policy for how the DOD uses health in stability operations. And uh, okay, it's working. This is this is uh, some excerpts from uh, DoD Directive 3000.05, which was issued in 2005. Now the DoD has been doing, or the military, I should say, uh, technically, has been doing a lot of health interventions both in the United States. I worked for the Indian Health Service before the 1950s, Bruno. Indian Health Service was the War Department, wasn't it? Yeah, so in some ways the Indians think it still is the War Department, but uh, we won't go down that road. I won't wander off the reservation on that. Um, if you look at the kinds of things here that need to be done, uh, I, I won't read all this stuff to you, but, but what I would like to talk about is the common thread for, military, for the military health system that is separate from the rest of the military and also is different from, uh, I think, the other agencies. There's a common thread here in, in what we used to call STRO, which was uh, Stability, Security, Transition, Reconstruction Operations. Now we, it's, it's all been lumped together under the rubric of Stability Operations, which for some reason the military has decided to call STAB Ops. And as an emergency, <laughs> as an emergency physician, I'm not entirely comfortable with that term, but I have to live with the, the glossary they give me. Um, but if you look at, at stability operations, or stab ops, if you look at stability operations and you look at humanitarian assistance, which we define as emergency kinds of stuff, it's not the Oslo kind of stuff, and then you look at, at counterinsurgency, there's a common thread there for the military health system. And, and in order to understand the importance of this, you need to understand that the military health system was not set up to take care of host nation civilians. The military health system was set up to take care of military personnel. And then, oh, by the way, we've got Geneva Conventions, so we also have to take care of host nation civilians that wander into the line of fire or happen to be in that compound when we drop a predator on it or something like that. So we wind up with them. And in fact, when I w was uh, a patient of a combat support hospital, there were two Americans in the ward that I was in and there were I think, if I remember right, about nine Iraqis. This is in 2003 during the invasion. And of those nine Iraqis, two were enemy prisoners of war and three were children, uh, toddlers, really young children. So, so that's what the patient mix turned out to be. And we're required by law to take care of those, those people and, and ethically, I might add. Um, the other place where we run into this is that if we're an occupying power, we as a government, now I'm talking the US, we U.S. government and other governments uh, who are occupying powers are required to provide essential services, the life and death services. So there are places where we being the U.S. government are going to have to do that and sometimes the DOD, especially when the bullets are flying, is the only agency that can do that. <coughs> But if you look at stability operations, humanitarian assistance, and counterinsurgency, you find that the common thread with the military health system is that by design, by nature, we then interact with the host nation civilians on purpose, not because they wandered into the line of fire, not because we broke the country and now all of a sudden we own it for a little while until we can get out of there, but because by on purpose, we're going there to do this stuff. And we don't have a good doctrine on that. We don't have the doctrine right now. That's sort of what my job is, is to you know, put together a division that can, can do that. And, and I think we're making some progress there. So any conceptions that you have about what the military was doing a year ago are pretty much obsolete <coughs> now. 
and and indeed any any uh, any uh, assumptions that you or I have about what we're doing now will be obsolete at the end of this talk because I guarantee you that based on the feedback we're going to change where we're going with policy. So this is this these things are important. Um, on the next slide. Did I go backwards using this one? Preview. Okay. Um, there's a little political incorrectness here, and God forbid that I should be politically incorrect. So where it says medical, use your word finder and please put in health in your own minds. Um, but the military tends to use medical and health interchangeably. Um, there are a number of different kinds of things that the military health system does with regards to health in interacting with host nation infrastructure, health infrastructure, and host nation civilians. So I won't, I won't belabor that, that slide, and I also won't belabor this slide. No. Okay. Except to say that we, we sort of, we've been there, we've done that, we got the t-shirt for it. But all the guys that been there, done that, got the T-shirt, are retired or dead. And so we have to learn this all over again. Every time we go someplace and do these kinds of things, w we have to learn it all over again. And the conventional warfighting military has never, you know, when you're worried about the Soviet Union coming through the Fulda Gap, you're not really worrying about the guerrilla war, uh, war fighting that's going on in El Salvador, for example. And so we tend to ignore those lessons that, that we've been learning, and we just, they just drop off to the side. So hopefully with some doctrine, we'll be able to stop reinventing this stuff. And uh, I think the other thing that's important there is that w there's a, a much greater recognition, just as the DOD has recognized that the Army, Air Force, Navy have to, have to blend together to fight and reestablish com Now, um, Three months ago, this would have been very difficult to do because three months ago, let's face it, we didn't have clear leadership. We didn't have clear direction from our leadership on what we were doing. But in, within a period of about six months in, in uh, Afghanistan, we went from uh, development to counterterrorism to counterinsurgency. Now we're doing counterinsurgency, okay? So when you talk about development, I'm not really hearing what you have to say. I don't really care so much about development because the guys that I'm interested in, the men and women that I'm interested in right now, are the men and women that have to wear body armor because the places they are are so hostile. And what I'm interested in is how do we use health and how do we use healthcare infrastructure to decrease the threat to them and to increase their ability to accomplish their mission. And their mission is probably, if you think about it, is probably stability and security. And the stability and security permits what? Those are the permissive circumstances for development, right? So in a way, you've heard, you've heard talk about, geez, what if, we, what if we lose in Afghanistan? It's an evolving, the, the, the theater is evolving. And some places it's devolving. And so there are going to be areas where you have development occurring in one place. Other places, you're going to have counterinsurgency. Indeed, as the guerrilla war matures, if we're not winning, you're going to see conventional land forces, Taliban conventional land forces. So, you know, we need to think ahead. We need to think about what we're doing. And the situation is going to be changing all over the country in different places. We'll be doing different kinds of things. But if you look at the differences between uh, development and counterinsurgency, at least um, the principles of development and the principles of counterinsurgency, the uh, principles on the, on the right of counterinsurgency come from the um, Army and Marine uh, FM 3-24 counterinsurgency manual. And if you look at the principles of devel development, I'm sorry, on the left, on the right, um, you look at uh, USAID principles of development. They're not that different. They're not that different. The way they're stated, I think, tells you something about the culture. Um, but what we're looking for in counterinsurgency is the opportunity to extend the reach of the government primarily, at least in Afghanistan. And we can debate about whether the government is a functional government or a dysfunctional government, but that's, 
That's for other people to debate, and I can talk to you about that offline as an anthropologist. But, um, but what I'd like for you to do is compare and contrast the worldview and the mindset that are evident in this. Now, um, where DOD is doing counterinsurgency, who's the lead? Not DOD. Right, exactly, Bruno. It's Department of State is the lead. The embassy, the country team is the lead. And USAID falls under the country team. DOD falls under the country team. So the State Department has to lead us in the counterinsurgency. And the reason for that is that a counterinsurgency is described as being primarily political. I think that's because we're used to political process. I would say that, it, that, I would say that counterinsurgency is primarily a sociocultural issue. It's a, a matter of, of establishing trust, building mutual trust, building bonds of trust between the government and the people, building bonds of trust between this tribe and that tribe, building bonds of trust between this person and that person who have disputes, that the rule of law can solve these things. And the rule of law can, although it doesn't work in everybody's absolute favor every time, it averages out. And it keeps us from going out and shooting each other over property disputes, things like that. Now, the U.S. has some military capabilities in counterinsurgency. And right here are the medical units. Anybody know how many medical personnel we have? I don't, but I think it's like 114,000. Isn't it, Patrick? It's like a lot. It's too many, yeah, counting reservists. We have a huge medical capacity. One of the problems is we don't have training. These folks are trained to provide care to soldiers and sailors and, and airmen and Marines that are shot or, or that you know drive into a ditch or something. But they're not trained to take care of host nation civilians. They're not trained very well to interact with host nation infra health infrastructure. And we're moving to change that through the uh, medical stability operations course that, that we're, uh, we're developing curriculum for. Hopefully, all the eventually all medical personnel from DOD who go downrange, uh, whether it's to Afghanistan or elsewhere, will be getting some instruction on on, on those kinds of things. But uh, we're not there yet. We understand that. Now, the uh, Army Marine Field Manual uh, has the preferred division of labor, and if you look at this, it says it's always preferred for civilians to perform civilian tasks. There are many U.S. agencies and civilian IGOs with more expertise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hence, the preferred or ideal division of labor is frequently unattainable. That's the bottom line on the preferred division of labor. We want to be led in counterinsurgency. We want State Department to lead us in that. When it comes to development, we want USAID to lead us in that. But sometimes when you're like, like I was, and I think probably even like Bruno was, when you're out there in the middle of of the, of the streets and, and, and the bullets are flying, um, the reason you're there is because only DOD will be there, although, ironically, we're both public health service, but nevertheless, speaking for DOD. Um, now, I put a note to myself here. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want this next thing I'm going to say to get out to Al-Qaeda or Taliban. So if there are any Taliban or Al-Qaeda in the room, please leave for a moment and then you can come back in. Um, if you want to cripple the United States government, I think all you have to do is ask this question. What agency in the U.S. government is responsible for blank? And the U.S. government will be incapable of performing that function <laughs> for the next, you know, ungodly amount of time because there will be uh, acrimony and recriminations and all kinds of discussion about that. And I suppose unless it worked out real well and then there'd be a lot of people arguing over taking the credit. <laughs> but um, I think we're coming to the point where we're getting over that. And the reason I can say that is because I have so many friends here in the room from the other agencies. So the realistic division of labor is that if, 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 if I'm the guy who's out there in body armor wearing a, a colonel's insignia and and, uh, and and there are, are kids with sores all over their faces or there's an outbreak of malaria or something like that, then I'm the guy who has to decide whether 
to spray the malaria or give everybody Neosporin or Bacitracin or whatever we're going to do for those problems. And, and later on, somebody else is going to come along and say, you know what? You made the government look bad when you did that. And I'm going to say, yeah, well, that sucks. You know, but that's life. And, and so there's a, we have to live in the real world. We have to live not just in the real world of D.C., but we have to live in the real world of operations. And that, that's one of my take-home messages. The transition is always difficult. And people, soldiers, always ask me, how do we know when to make the transition to the other agencies? And my, my answer is fairly simple. It's, it's when they're there. When, the, when, they're, when they're there and you've got like three months to do the handoff now, then you make that transition right then. But you can't transition to somebody who's not there. You can't transition to somebody who's loggered up at an FOB if you're out in the field. You can't transition your, your operation in Helmand or, or Herat or somewhere. You can't transition that to somebody who doesn't leave Kabul. So the transition is going to require some, I think, some culture change. Um, I want to say that uh, one of, as an anthropologist, I'll say, this is no surprise to, to any of the bureaucrats here, um, that the U.S. government has been criticized for trying to solve problems by throwing money at them. So whenever we have a problem, what do we do? We throw money at it. We got a health care problem, we throw money at it. God forbid we should get people to quit smoking. No, we're going to throw money at the health care problem. If we, and I'm, this is not, believe me, this is not a partisan talk. Um, this is a cultural talk. If we, if we have a, a, you know, a problem with gangs, we throw money at it. But I'm not sure we have effective interventions for those things. And we've been criticized in, in Iraq for throwing you know, $50 billion worth of money at problems that never got solved. Now, Secretary Gates, and this is probably where I, and we're being webcast, thank you very much. This is probably where I lose my job. But, <laughs> um, but it's been fun. Uh, <laughs> Secretary Gates has been very, very forthcoming in pointing out that uh, USAID is under, under resourced, under financed, and understaffed, and uh, so is State Department. And I think there's little to argue with about that. The question I have as an anthropologist is that can those things be solved by throwing money at them, or does it require a culture change? Do we have to go back to our Vietnam era where we had USAID in the field with us working alongside us so that as it was with public health service, one time I told a, a guy wearing a uniform to get his Beretta and cover that sector of fire, and he said, I'm public health service. And I said, well, we'll talk about that when we get back to the team house, but right now you cover that sector of fire. And that's the kind of presence we need downrange with State Department and with, uh, with USAID, and dare I say it, with uh, public health service and the health and human services. Uh, and until we get that, uh, all of the interagency talk, uh, a lot of it's going to be moot. I'm running out of time. Let me just run through a couple topics really quickly. Um, this is where, this, this is the mess that is command and control in Afghanistan right now. This is the mess that is command and control. Can, most of you can, not everybody can see it. In case, in case you're not familiar with it, how, who's the boss? Who's the boss? Who's, Who's the, who's the final arbiter of what's going to be done? And this is what, like, late last night when I was reviewing my slides, I came up with the Anderson Complexity Index. And <laughs> you take the number of nations involved in an effort, and you multiply it by the number of agencies that are involved in that effort, and you wind up with problems in languages, interpreters, national systems of reporting and accounting, international systems like the United Nations, World Bank, when it comes to reporting and accounting, organizational systems, ethical and cultural norms, variations and assumptions. It really, this organization is, is, is set up for failure. And I think that as a, you know, DOD is all about unity of command. And I think that we need to get some unity of command out of this. Um, this is another slide. This was put together by an Air Force colonel. And as an anthropologist, I'll tell you this is typical of Air Force colonels. And, and if Don Thompson disagrees with me, I'll show you one of his slides I saw about a year ago. <laughs> um, but this is, this is C. Stickett 
These are all things that Joe Anderson over there now uh, told me that CSTIC was involved in. And, and if you look at them, Mi Ministry of Public Health, World Health Organization, the PRTs, National Police, National Army, ISAF, Ministry of Higher Education with the Kabul Medical University curriculum. Uh, and unfortunately, USAID has a pretty little ellipse right there. And I think that should be a lot bigger. But, but that's just what CSTIC is involved in. And that's their, that's um, too complex. It's too many moving parts. It's just not going to work. Let's just, let's just be honest about this stuff. It's just not going to work. We need a top down and a bottom up revision of how we're doing this, how we're fighting this counterinsurgency. Um, I think I'm just going to go to my last slide now, which is to show you in anthropological terms. <laughs> <laughs> but they're only a planet away from each other. They're just sort of, neither one of them actually touches the Earth, though. Um, and I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to point out that a, a lot of folks from our International Health Division are here. And I'd like for you to uh, please try to take the opportunity to get to know them, uh, some really outstanding people. And I would like for them to get to know you as well, because uh, we do have to work hard on this policy. And uh, I, I think it's, this is you know, life and death stuff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Butch. Uh, now we'll have uh, an outside perspective of someone who has looked at the programs uh, with a great deal of experience, Ann Peterson. Oh, thank you so much. Um, it is an honor to be here. I don't know if I actually qualify as an outside perspective because, in fact, certainly have AID background. I've worked with DOD and HHS, so, you know, uh, perhaps it's the cross-cutting, and that's actually what I'm hoping to bring to you today. Um, I was privileged to be able to go to Afghanistan and try and get a broad look at what it was going on from the U.S. government perspective, not from the Afghan government perspective alone, not from a single agency perspective alone, but to look very broadly. It was commissioned by USAID, thank you USAID, but it was very, very important in what we were doing that we had a steering committee that included HHS, USAID, Department of Defense, and Department of State. So we were answerable to everybody, and we really tried to stay objective. The goal, let's see if I can move this thing forward. No. One more time. There we go. Uh, was to be able to, oh no, we're, thank you to look at what the U.S. government writ large was doing in Afghanistan, to look for how the, the different agencies were coordinating with one another, the programmatic coordination as well as the communication around it, and how they were aligned with the Afghan priorities. Both of our previous speakers talked about the importance of supporting the Afghan government and legitimizing the Afghan government, and we were to look at, is that really happening or is it not really happening? Um, as we went, there we go, um, it is clear that every agency that's involved in a country has their own specific mandates. USAID is a development agency. DOD has security as its main focus, and we have Department of State for Diplomacy and um, HHS for Health and Communicable Disease Control. As we were going, it was also the time that um, Afghanistan was rising again in importance and um, Holbrook's white paper was coming out. So beginning to look at what are the overarching U.S. government policies and how would specific e agency mandates fall into that. So as we went forward, and I know Sapita is going to talk lots more about the policy things, it really became clear to us that what we needed to look at was not just what was U.S. government doing to promote improvements in health and having a health goal, but also where were we relative to COIN? Was it possible to have smart power? Um, the picture here on the left or on, on the right was actually from a visit I made in 2004 out into Herat District and we were with a group of Muslim men, and they gave this story about the programs, even then, that were happening in Afghanistan. 
saying their women were no longer dying in childbirth, their children were no longer sick, and they saw it as part of the peace dividend. So this was their words that because there was peace, they were able to have these health programs that were changing the lives of their family. So for our team, this idea that you could have dual goals at least seemed possible. The question is, were we as a U.S. government really promoting it, or was that not happening? It was just wishful thinking. <coughs> um, Bill did a lovely job talking about the health situation. I will only pick out some of the highlights. Um, situation was bad when the Taliban left. I think in all my years of working in public health, that this piece, the development of the basic package of health service and the EPHS, the focus that Afghanistan took in the reconstruction is really key. It's not singularly unique, but it's not very usual, and I think it was really, really important. And while USAID was instrumental in this, it was also very strongly part of the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Public Health, and the Minister of Health saying, this is what we want to do in rebuilding our country. And I think that's a strong part of why there has been so much success in rebuilding Afghanistan in ways that I haven't seen in many, many other countries. And again, Bill showed you most of that. I just want to say, yes, when we went, we truly not only saw the data that shows that the health is improving, but in fact, the stories from people. Everyone is acknowledging that, in fact, there is huge progress in the health of the people. So of our dual goals, we know we're making some progress. We still have to measure maternal mortality, but we know we're making progress. The other, and let's see if I can get myself back one slide. Nope. Yep. Go back up for me, thank you. One more, right there. This was the other very fascinating, and I mean, how does one measure contribution to COIN? I don't know, I think we need to work on indicators, but this was a quote that we heard from an Afghan as we were going around and then we tested it with a number of different audiences. The Ministry of Public Health is the only ministry that does not have a shadow Taliban counterpart. Ooh, isn't that interesting? What does that mean both about the functioning of the Ministry of Public Health? Why do other ministries have shadow counterparts? There's a justice system that the Taliban runs, there's education systems. What does it mean that the Ministry of Health doesn't have that equivalent shadow Taliban counterpart? And is that part of a contribution to a coin strategy? And is it just happenstance? Or is it something that we can think about, learn, and maybe move forward in the future? Um, the key on the health progress is that when I talked to the Minister of Health, Fatima, who is now gone, the Deputy Minister and many others, they will acknowledge that, in fact, it's the three donor agencies, USAID, World Bank, and EC, that have worked through the BPHS who have made this possible for them. So the combined focus and then the agencies that have allowed them to um, implement that progress. There we go. Um, I won't go very deep into what we found for each of the different agencies, but we did specifically look at each one of the major agencies, did this absolutely massive um, table of all the different programs they had, how those programs contributed to health goals, contributed to the Afghan national priorities, and how it contributed to the U.S. government priorities, and just did a cross-tabulation. Are we going where we should be going? Um, it was interesting and important to outline exactly what each of the agencies did and who they are because, in fact, one of the key findings was the agencies didn't know one another. So we had folks from DOD who said 10 months into their 12-month time, they actually found out AID was there and they began to learn what AID did and realized there was a resource they did not know about. Now, that's a year old, and I am sure it's getting better. Um, but the description of who the different agencies are is, in fact, a transforming piece of information for them. So in Afghanistan, USAID has been one of the big players since 2002, has been instrumental in um, much of the BPHS and EPHS. I will add a special note on the health systems that Bill pointed out. 
and that is as I looked at it from a very high level and especially keeping the two goals in mind, it is clear that having a really vibrant health management information system, doesn't that sound boring, data, numbers, you know, reporting people getting sick? In fact, what it has done is set up a tra uh, an objective and transparent way of doing business in the health sector. So there were clear jobs and clear criteria for skills, clear, clear hiring and firing criteria. You knew what was happening in different places. So it, it led to good governance that wasn't otherwise possible that then helped legitimize the um, Ministry of Public Health. Did not get rid of all of the problems, but people could say, well, you know, it's an awful lot better. The, the places that are a little slippery, they're, they're really small now. So this HMIS system, while it looks very systems-oriented and uninteresting, has probably been enormously important for good governance, which I believe contributes to COIN. HHS um, has a specific initiative, the African Health Initi Afghanistan Health Initiative, which is in the maternal, mater maternal hospital in Kabul, Rabi Yabal. Um, and it has involved very nicely many of the different agencies. So your complexity slide, um, you could add to that that any one of the agencies has its own bundle of internal things, and this particular initiative is a good example. So Indian Health Service is there, and CDC, and I mean HHS itself. There's been a host of things. In addition, USAID has funded HHS, mainly CDC, but also NIOSH is there, um, to do specific things. And as we were evaluating the agencies, we were looking for, can we define a comparative advantage? When is something really within AID's realm, or HHS's realm, or DOD's realm? This is that question with the line that, that Butch brought up for us. Um, but tried to define what they're doing now and what are they really good at for each of the agencies. Department of State has the congressional mandate to coordinate. What was a little interesting and disturbing was there was great excitement and willingness to do that here in D.C., but we saw much less of that interest or willingness to coordinate um, at least the health activities in Afghanistan and get the engagement. There was a huge clamor and call for that coordination, just like you heard from Dr. Anderson. Um, Department of Defense, again, I will go very, very quickly. I will summarize, if you could possibly do that for something as complex as DOD, the main missions that we heard expressed from DOD itself. That number one is force health for the troops. They're there to keep their own guys healthy. Number two, force health training the Afghan national forces, how to take care of their soldiers. Third was, quote, health sector development, but within health sector development, it included working with Afghan leadership. It included the service to civilians, as you heard earlier, both casualty and other, and it included going out into the villages in other places and some assessment and reconstruction. One of the huge advantages, obviously, that was alluded to earlier is the large footprint that DOD has, and with many personnel, lots of contractors, and lots of funds. So the SERP funds are large. They are designated for dealing with civilian issues, not military personnel. Not very much of it goes to health right now, but it is rapidly mobile, and they are large dollars. So just a really quick overview. So what's the elephant in the room? Some things aren't going so very well in Afghanistan. Um, in the health realm, we don't know what's happening in maternal health. We think it's going better, but we don't know yet. Um, and the fact that we can't yet find out is a problem in and of itself. And we certainly know that in the south and in the east, some of the very conservative areas, we are still struggling to find women who will be allowed to be trained to care for the other Pashtun women in those areas. Um, the economic crisis and then the food crisis began to underpin. So it isn't just the health sector, it is also health related to many other sectors. And then of course, 
the increasing insecurity. My first trip to Afghanistan as I was flying to Herat, one of the NGOs was flying out one of their American staff people who'd had a, a stab wound to the chest um, in his own compound. The Afghan NGOs the previous week had lost two. We know that there is increasing and active targeting of civilian aid workers, um, including health personnel. So the NGOs who are out there are doing it at some risk to themselves. Well, for every complex problem, there is a simple solution, right? And it's usually wrong. <laughs> um, every one of the organizations, agencies, is doing really good stuff, absolutely well-intentioned, and they all have their limitations. You've actually already heard most of USAID's limitations. They are understaffed um, and underfunded for the work that they are being asked to do. And as we talk with DOD, and I heard exactly what Dr. Anderson said, we want AID to guide us in the development programs, but frankly, there's not enough people. There's a huge footprint for DOD, and now they know AID exists, and they're asking for exactly the kind of information USAID has, and there are not enough people to be rapidly responsive, especially with a huge number of very fast-moving, flexible SERP funds. So that's the major limitation, that and being locked down on the bases. The contractors could get out. When I was there with three other women, we were going from place to place because no one could come to see us. In fact, we had to go visit the military guys on the base because they weren't allowed to come to our hotel, but three, four women were allowed to go traveling around Kabul. So, um, I think Dr. Anderson um, pointed out most of these. I will say that um, the overwhelming message as we interviewed dozens and dozens of people, in the end over 250, the great desire to do more. Most of the DOD personnel in the health realm are activated, you know, docs, nurses, people that are, do regular practice here in the U.S. They come to Afghanistan, whole new world, whole new task, and they see a world of hurt they've never seen before. And the desire to do something and make a difference is huge. And they start doing their very, very best, and about halfway into their time, they realize it's not going very well. So the level of distress that we heard from especially the DOD personnel who are wanting to do the right thing and don't know what it is or how to do it better was actually um, quite overwhelming, to, at least for my own stereotypes, I never expected to be in a room with 30 macho military guys and have them in cheers because of the, the distress that they were feeling in the disconnect between what they were asked to do and the skills that they had to bring to bear to it. Okay, time to walk down again. It really wants to stay on that slide. There, um, back one. Again, the throwing money at a rack. We heard this um, a number of times, but I think more important wasn't just the throwing money at a problem, it was the short time frames for action. There was the desire to do something visible and immediate, but there were, there were overarching goals, but not strategic long-term goals, and there wasn't any follow-up. A SERP funds were the commander's re emergency response, and he needed to spend it while he was there, and then he was gone. So there wasn't a mechanism for looking, that money that was spent this year, what was the impact the next year, the next year, the next year? And we, um, as we went around, certainly the NGOs would talk about the huge military presence. We traveled in the military vehicles in Ghazni, armed and uniformed uh, soldiers going in to the hospitals where Afghan women are lying in beds, the cultural issues of that interface is very difficult. Donations, um, these examples of wells are the, um, we saw a number of times, and you'll hear many of these kinds of stories, 
great intentions. We know they need safe drinking water. They dig a well. They give a generator, only they give such a large, wonderful, huge generator. There is no petrol, no gasoline to keep it running so that uh, a few months later it is dysfunctional and people are back to where they were before. But there's an important point for that one, and that is in the work that people are doing, Afghanistan started in very, very bad shape in 2002. And we've all been working very hard to do better and improve what's going on. And so there has been huge gain. And in many of the parts of the world that I work in, people will go, yes, we're making great progress. And you heard that today. What I saw, and I was not expecting it in Afghanistan, was that that gain is real, but in our um, promises and in the things that we are doing, we have actually led them to believe in the communities at the highest level and at also at the small village level that they were going to get something more than this, more than actually got delivered. And so what you have then is a gap between what was delivered and what they were expecting. And so instead of having the rejoicing of the gains, which are real, you actually have the dissatisfaction of unmet expectations. And this has happened when clinics have been overbuilt, when the technology that's been brought in isn't appropriate and can't be sustained. The underestimates of the population, I mean, that sounds like a minor thing. But in fact, if you look at Afghanistan, the parts of Afghanistan that are growing the fastest, highest reproductive rate, are in the south and the east. The BPHS and the EPHS are based on population estimates that happened previously. They map out the amount of services, the amount of drugs based on the population. And then when you deliver it across the country, now a number of years later, you have too little going to the south. You have Gore province with stock loads of pharmaceuticals in their back cupboard. And in the south, where we are most concerned about the conflict and the insurgency, is exactly where people have been promised services, staff, medicines, and it's in short supply. And part of it is we just don't have accurate estimates of population in a flexible enough system to say, aha, we need to rejigger and resupply um, the places based on the population. This is in itself a simple and easy thing to flex and begin to address it on a population basis. Now, is it possible? That's actually going to take some systems issues or a census, which again, like maternal mortality, has been planned and hasn't happened because of conflict. So um, small issues can, in fact, be both difficult and transforming. Unrealized expectations can cause no harm not only in the U.S. government to Afghanistan relationships, but also on the legitimizing the government of Afghanistan. Just a few notable quotes from all of the people that we talked to. We didn't really know what USAID did. The complexity is an obstacle made worse by turnover. There should be some kind of mapping to guide new staff. Turnover kept coming up because people were learning actively, but then they were gone. Or they built a relationship, and then they were gone. Um, the DOD wants USA and civilian agencies to tell them what to do, but they're too few. It's too slow. Oh, and the Ministry of Health, please give us just one US government person to talk to, or one committee, somebody, just not everybody. Um, so some really interesting pieces. Then we realized that, in fact, some simple frames would help the different agencies begin to think about what can they do in different parts of Afghanistan. Because the other elephant in the room, of course, is the conflict zones. What you can do in Herat is not the same as what you can do in Helmand. But how do you know what you can do? And as Dr. Anderson said, how do you make the transitions? How do you know when to do the transitions? So we began to talk with the Afghans themselves about what kinds of triggers would let you know you could move to the next stage. How do you begin the work in the conflict zones so they are planned to opportunistically you know, 
find an opportunity to do training and, and take that so that you have the staff and the people during those small moments when, you, when something allows you to do it. In sort of the, the final pieces is the time is really now. Distress is high and compared to a couple years ago where the agencies both um, culturally and by policy were not working together, the agencies now want to work together. They are ready, they're willing, they're actually champing at the bit to find ways to, to do that um, and to coordinate both programmatically and in um, communications. They need to know who each other are. I love the slide that essentially laid out the same kind of principles but in the different languages of the agencies because that is very, very real that they speak sometimes exactly the same thing but in different words and they don't even realize they're saying the same thing to one another. Turnover is a huge issue, <laughs> definitely needs to be addressed and we need some balance between the agencies. If we're really gonna do coordination, then we have to have enough people to do it, to be there. It's um, a manpower issue for each of them and there needs to be a lead US government coordinating mechanism and an agency. Um, on the programming front, clear goals. Uh, one of the things that not just for Afghanistan but in many, many places we've seen is that you just need to be able to um, enunciate shared goals and that overcomes many of the differences between the agencies. And then you have to measure the contributions to those agencies. So AID has a long tradition of measuring outcomes. As HHS has started on their Af Afghanistan health initiative, they've been tracking things and in fact it's been very eye-opening and instrumental when they started to look at what was happening with outcomes and allowed them to go back and do some quick reconstruction on their programs to improve them. But you've got to look or you won't do it right, move it forward. Um, there are lots of controversy on um, what lane DOD should be in and what it should be doing, but if DOD is going to continue to do the kind of development, they need the capacity for their own people. <coughs> There's a very strong ethos of, um, I won't say, I think perfection isn't the right word, but you know, if you're going to do it well, you need, or you're going to do something for DOD, you should be doing it really, really well. And yet, in this particular area, people are out there without the capacity to do what they really need. And do no harm, we talk about that all the time in public health, but in the case of Afghanistan, I think it's really important to think about don't create expectation gaps that you cannot fill. That's a different twist on it, but seems to have been very, very instrumental in Afghanistan in having some of our well-intentioned, pretty good programs actually probably cause harm to the overall legitimization of the, of the government of Afghanistan in our relationship with them. Okay, one more, I think we're almost done. So, where are we on the dual goals of health and COIN? Is it conflict of interest or creative tension? The big footprint has big potential. DOD is here to stay, sometimes when I say that. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Uh, be before we hear from Senpai, he's, she's going to give us all the answers about what the policy <laughs> of course, that's is as a I base asked. on all that. But these have been terrific presentations, and I'm sure you have questions. So I'd like to find out if we could, is Brian here? Oh, you are here. If we can have the room for another 15 minutes after 3.30 so we can get questions.
Thank you, sir. If you could all stay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here, although I have to say I feel at a disadvantage speaking after all these great presentations. And as I'm sure you can see from the two little letters at the, behind, my, um, behind my name, I'm not a health expert. So what I'll be talking about is not specifically about health, but as they said, just about what are the U.S. government policies when it comes to health. Um, I also have to apologize. I don't have a PowerPoint presentations. When I was over at USAID, I learned how to do them, and I would have probably done all sorts of animations for you. But sitting over at state, they're not as enamored with PowerPoints. And as was <laughs> described before, you know, they, they talk about DODs from Mars and USAIDs from Venus. I'm not quite sure where State Department <laughs> falls into that. Um, but, you know, I, I'm learning. I'm managing. Um, Len started with a couple of quotes from the Secretary's speech a couple of days ago. And I would like to follow up on that and talk about another quote that she gave during that day, because apparently there were a lot of really great quotes of um, part of her presentation. Um, one of the things she said is, whether it's to improve long-term security in places torn apart by conflict like Afghanistan, or to further progress in countries that are on their way to becoming regional anchors of stability, we pursue development for the same reasons. To improve lives, fight poverty, expand rights and opportunities, strengthen communities and secure democratic institutions and governance. And in doing so, advance global stability, improve our own security, and project our values and leadership in the world. And, and, and I think this is really a perfect time to be having this discussion, given that it is two days after the secretary spoke about um, you know, what she saw as, de excuse me, as development in the 21st century and the day after the new um, USAID administrator, Raj, Dr. Rajiv Shah, was sworn in because the speech that he gave also really touched upon a lot of these, um, a lot of these issues. You know, what are we doing in terms of development? Why are we doing it? What is our role? And, and there's, a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of principles that they've talked about, which then takes me to the question that was asked of this panel and as the invitation went out, which was what are the goals for and implications of U.S. health initiatives in Afghanistan? Is it to address health needs of a suffering population for state capacity building or to support counterinsurgency? And as Anne said, um, for every complex problem, there's a simple solution. Um, I'm here to provide you with a simple solution. And my answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> it is all of those. Um, and of course, there is a longer answer, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And, and I won't speak very long because, you know, you've heard a lot, and I know you all have a lot of questions that you've been holding for the past hour and a half, and I know you want to get those out. But the way um, I want to present that to you, what are the goals of our health programs in Afghanistan, frankly, are not just the goals of our, just our health programs. These are the goals of a lot of our, for, of our development assistance, of our civilian assistance in Afghanistan. And I've put them under four categories. And a lot of these you've heard before, but I tried to change the wording a little bit because I think sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced than, than what we talked about. And, and this is really in no particular order, so don't think that I'm making one any more important than the other one. Um, the first one is contribution to sustained stability. Um, and, and this is, for example, you know, we've talked about military operations, you know, where people are shooting at you, where there are bullets flying, what do you do? And th this is really what we're talking about. And, you, and I did not say to provide stability, but I said to, to contribute to a sustained stability. And, and I would really like to have a discussion about that, actually, at the question and answer period, because I think those are different things. Um, and the question that also, um, and the question I would actually propose to that in terms of, um, you know, what, what do you do when there's a lot of great need and there are bullets flying, my question would be, what actually really does need to get done in that situation? There's a lot of needs. There's a lot of things you could do. But when there is this insecure, unstable situation, what, does it, what is it that you actually have to get done as a first order of business? Um, the second one is improving the capacity of the Afghan government institutions and the Afghan government. And again, I did not say capacity building. What I said is improving the capacity. Because what we very often forget 
in many, many countries, but specifically in Afghanistan, because the level of capacity, the base is so low, we forget that there's actually something there, and there is something to build upon, and there are, there's a culture there, there is a way of doing things that you really do need to take into consideration, and you work off of that. And, and a great example of this is actually the Ministry of Public Health. Um, it is amazing that the ministry is already receiving funds directly from the, Af from the U.S. government, and you know they're, they're managing to hire and contract the NGOs themselves. We were doing this through an implementer, and now we're no longer doing that. And that goes to show that there actually really is a lot there. I mean, obviously, it takes leadership from the ministry. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of improving capacity that we've done in the past several years. But again, we were working off of some kind of a base. Um, and the third one that is very related to improving the capacity is building of governance. And I think um, you know, several people talked about that. Because again, the issue is you know, if, if the government institutions can actually do the work themselves, that does improve governance. And we, we always talk about connecting the people to their government. And, and I think to that some extent that leads into that. And then finally is um, the long-term engagement and partnership with the Afghan people. What we've been hearing a lot lately, um, and this was not just in the Secretary's speech, but also in the President's speech, is we are here for the long term in Afghanistan. And so what that means is a lot of these programs will continue, but in a different manner. And, and again, that goes back to you know, um, why are we here for all of these reasons? Because there are the short-term reasons where we do health programs, but also education programs and justice programs or other civil assistance programs. But there is the long-term of, okay, once you've achieved some kind <coughs> of a stability, security, then what? Um, so that is a somewhat longer answer of you know, what, what, are, what are the reasons we're doing that. So, so it really is a little bit of everything. And um, I, I think it has to be timed, it has to be sequenced. You have different objectives for your program in different places at different times. Obviously what you're doing in the south in Helmand and in Kandahar is very different from what you're doing in mazar sharif at this particular moment. What you're doing in Helmand today is going to be very different from what you're going to be doing in Helmand maybe six months from now, maybe a year from now, maybe three months from now, I don't know. So, so all of these um, really have their own different timelines and the different objectives at these different times. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to talk about, and, and then I think I'll be done and you guys can ask all your questions I'm sure you've been holding, um, is the other thing that we're doing is we actually are changing the way we're doing business. And, and I know this has created a lot of questions, this has created a lot of concerns in the past several months um, within the different communities in which we work. But that really also does go back to the reasons we're doing these programs. Um, we're trying to move away from having the type of implementers that we've had our programs doing the job to more increasing the capacity and really moving more towards the local implementers and the Afghan government itself. And as you've seen in the case of the Ministry of Public Health, we've been able to do that. That doesn't mean that the Ministry of Health is able to do all the work on their own and they don't need any assistance, any technical assistance or training from us. But we've made a real effort to move in that direction. Um, and then focusing really on Afghan government, Afghan institutions, and local implementation. Um, and again, I, I know this has caused some concerns, and I would be happy to discuss any of those if you have. But, um, and again, we're not just doing this in Afghanistan. We're going to be doing it in all of our programs. This does go back to the Secretary's speech, which is we are here to build a partnership with these countries, to work with them, to really build on what they can do and what they have been able to do. Um, and I will just really end by saying th this really is an amazing sector because there is an amazing amount that has been done and has been achieved, as you've heard from the other um, three presenters. The maternal um, mortality has decreased, I guess infant mortality has decreased, you know, the, the amount of services that are available to people, but there obviously is a lot to do. And as we think about the next steps that we have to, do, to go and then the rest of what we have to do, um, let's just keep in mind these principles that we've talked about. Why are we there? Why are we doing these health programs?
Well, thank you to all four of you for terrific and very illuminating presentations. Uh, I have good news and bad news for, for everyone out here, uh, everyone here. The bad news is I'm going to use the privilege of the chair to ask the first question. The good news is only going to be one question. <laughs> uh, and when you do ask a question, please go to the microphone, or do we have one to move around? If not, you'll have to line up at the microphone. Uh, my question is, is this. Also, please identify yourself when you, you ask the question. My question for everyone on the panel is this. We've heard a lot about how to harmonize counterinsurgency and development objectives, and that you've all talked about that in one way or another. The question I want to ask you is one of the questions that was in the, in the notice, which is, are there tensions? Are there tensions between those goals? For example, in geographic, in areas of geographic investments and concern, are there tensions in short-term versus long-term objectives? Are there any other tensions? Could you all, or not all, you don't all have to answer this, but whoever would like to answer this, I think it would be helpful to, to know what you think about this. Go ahead. I think, um, <coughs> Yes, there are tensions and there have been tensions. I think uh, what we have to do is, first of all, not personalize any, uh, any of these things. And, and it's too easy to personalize the, these problems. The, the second thing is that we need clear leadership in terms of who's responsible for what issue. Uh, but I, I think the third thing is that we have to realize that um, the past is the past, and, and it's there to be learned from. Hopefully, it's it's there to caution us against future mistakes, and that as as <laughs> these agencies are living bodies, we need to learn and adapt uh, based on our past mistakes and to go forward and to uh, <coughs> improve the way we do things. And and I realize maybe that's being Pollyannaish or hopelessly optimistic, but um, I think we're doing that. Sure. <laughs> okay. um, again, the short answer is, of course, there are tensions, and I think there will continue to be tensions. Um, I mean, we went back, going back to the first slide, there, there are different cultures of people who are working in Afghanistan. Um, you know, there's a military, there is the um, U.S. government civilian, there are the NGOs, there are the contractors. I, I think we are all used to doing different things differently, and um, we, we do have the tension when we actually are trying to figure out what we're doing. And, and I actually will give an example. The first time I went to Afghanistan was in 2004, and I wasn't working on health. I was actually working on justice sector. And I had to work a lot with my military colleagues. And um, I had done that before in Haiti, but not to the extent where I was working with them in Afghanistan. <coughs> and it was really, really difficult until we said, you know what, let's just sit down around the same table and you explain to me what you're trying to do and what, why you're doing what you're doing, and I will explain to you the same thing. And once that happened, I mean, honestly, th there will continue to be tensions, but at least we knew where we were coming from. And I will go back to you know, what I was talking about. There are different situations in Afghanistan at different times. And I think both from the civilian and from the military, we need to recognize that. If you are in a very insecure environment, there are certain things that will take precedent, and security will be that. And I think people from the civilian side probably need to understand that. Now, when you go to the more secure areas, that shifts a little bit. And, and so you need to you know, work that through. And I will only say that, yes, in the short term versus long term, the same thing. There are tensions. Um, I, I think we're becoming actually better than that, better with that a little bit, but that will probably continue also. I can't really speak on behalf of the different governments. We're, we're an implementer and uh, not uh, part of government ourselves. Um, I think I would just share um, our experience has been that, um, that um, we primarily deal with USAID. Uh, the, they, um, the mission in Kabul is the one that is doing the primary interface with the military and with PRTs, which are the provincial reconstruction teams, which would be the ones that would be um, heavily involved in development. Um, we do provide a, a fair number of briefings for PRTs in that, but I think that uh, what stands out in my mind and was pointed out a couple times is the time frame. Uh, 
um, as development people, we've been involved in other countries too. Development, we know, is, is, a, is a long process. And so um, I guess you'd say we're in it for the long haul, so to speak. And often with the military, as we speak with them in that, it's not that you know we have different uh, purposes or one wants to do good and the other one doesn't or something. It's, but uh, their time frame, as is mentioned, is, is quite different uh, with the rotation of uh, personnel and that, that it's, it's a much, um, uh, it rolls over much more. Uh, the ministry, uh, you have a pretty, you have change over there, but it's, it's pretty constant. This, uh, the new minister will only be the third one since the Taliban left in 2002. So, um, so that's more of a perspective of an implementer that uh, USAID has been very helpful to us. Um, uh, we haven't felt pressures or tensions that, uh, and we haven't felt any, as I mentioned in the speech, we haven't been told to do a 180 degree turn. So it's not turning on a dime and doing something totally different. And, and we think that's really critical. Keep doing what you're doing uh, and then discussing how we can uh, do it in the insecure areas and uh, how we could ramp up there more in a um, reasonable way, one that's not um, erratic nor stupid in terms of um, what you can actually do in these areas where it's more restricted. I'd like to follow up on a, a little bit of that theme. Certainly, as we talk to different people in Afghanistan, especially the NGOs, um, we're very concerned that having a coin focus above a health focus was going to change the decision making and, in fact, could make a difference in, in the effectiveness and the prioritization of the health program. Um, one of the sort of insights as we went forward and um, Bill talked about health or development is a long-term process. That's every sector, not just the health sector, but it takes a long time to change outcome indicators and a whole culture of uh, how people deal with the health issue. I will venture to say that COIN and the counterinsurgency has more of an emphasis on trust and relationship building and meeting people's immediate and perceived needs. Now, in the health realm, we actually deal with this all the time. When you go into a new community and you're doing community health development, you need to address not just the long-term infant mortality and maternal mortality, you need to address the, the community's perceived need of, I want a clinic right now when my child is sick. And so this shouldn't be a, actually um, a new area of conflict or tension. We've walked this path lots and lots of times. We do need to address some of the visible needs, the perceived needs, and they need to, you need to have some quick wins if you're going to have um, trust built. People need to know that you've heard their needs and responding to it. So I think it's, it's not it is definitely tension and it will stay, but it's also that balance of how do we do some um, very visible addressing of perceived needs that will build the trust, that will contribute to COIN while doing good development at the same time. And I think we know how to do that. I think we just need to put that into our mindsets that we're gonna have to do some of the visible things while we keep in mind and set our goals and our accountability also for impacting on the long term. Thank you. First question. My name is Ken Dillon of Ciencia Press. Afghanistan has its own traditional medicine, Unani medicine, uh, and uh, it has, among other things, an important economic dimension because it's largely an herbal, me herbal medicine-based uh, system and Afghanistan was traditionally a major exporter of herbal medicines so that for the <laughs> farmers in Afghanistan, uh, it has some potential. I'm wondering, do we have a sense of how right now Unani medicine is functioning in Afghanistan? And secondly, has the United States or have other foreign organizations sought to reach out and interact with Unani practitioners? Uh, the ministry does have, a, um, I'm not sure if it's a full department of that, they do recognize and, um, and I, 
I don't remember whether it's under the pharmaceutical or separate, it, it'd be quite small on traditional medicine. So the minister and, and his staff have recognized it. It's not a uh, large component, not a large emphasis. So um, I'm not sure if I can precisely answer you other to say I, it's not ignored. Um, it's also not a huge element in terms of, uh, of um, uh, what's being um, provided and um, uh, whether that would make a, a major part in the future. Um, that would really be up to the ministry <laughs> leadership if they wanted to take it in that direction. Uh, and um, certainly uh, USAID and other donors um, you know, certainly have those discussions with the ministry and are willing to um, you know, follow as they have. So I would say that what you see right now is, is uh, the ministry's um, actions and, and direction that they have. So they've recognized it, but it's not a huge um, element on, in terms of uh, treatment and, and um, promotion, I guess you would say. Okay, and as far as you know, the far no other foreign organizations are involved with the UNANI sector. Um, there could be some small NGOs. I mean, there's so many folks that are involved. I guess uh, they certainly would not be a, a major uh, involved player. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is John Dunlop. I'm a health officer in the Office of Military Affairs at USAID. Um, health programs uh, tend to spring from, and health strategy springs from the Ministry of Health at a central level. Uh, rolls down to, uh, in many, most cases, district level uh, health services. Um, uh, I finished a tour in Iraq working on an, uh, an EPRT, and at, even as a health officer found it extraordinarily challenging for PRTs and EPRTs to play a positive role in, in the health sector, um, kind of at the local level. Um, I'm wondering about, in the Afghanistan context, uh, what is the role of the PRT um, for being a positive force in um, kind of improving the overall health situation and not kind of diverting health towards local tactical uh, issues and that sort of thing? If you could, if you could comment on that, would be great. Okay, I'll, I'll do a, a stab at that. Um, the, the PRTs have um, both security forces and they have the reconstruction teams which will include a, a USAID person to help guide the kinds of decisions that they are doing. In many of the provinces where USAID had somebody posted um, in the last couple years, so the kinds of examples we saw, they were building very close relationship between the health officers for the PRT from, from the DOD perspective and the pro provincial medical teams so that as there were SERP funds available from DOD and there were needs at the provincial level, um, those two were coming together and they were no longer being allowed to just go out and do things. It was being linked into um, the kind of reconstruction that the, the province was doing itself. Now, there were guidelines coming down from on top from the central government on where facilities could be placed and staffing and that, you know, so <coughs> the provincial medical team themselves, not the, the, the Afghan rather than the, the PRT, had their own strictures, but if they had needs, they could define them, send them up centrally, <coughs> And then if there was funding or expertise available from the PRT, it was being linked. So while it was partially top down, there was ability to do local tailoring and there was beginning to be, I'll say stronger than that, in some of the places there was very good cooperation so that in fact our PRTs were facilitating what was happening with within the provincial strategy. Now that's simultaneously with U.S. government, mainly USAID's programs that have been doing um, essentially management training of the provincial medical officers, the provincial health officers, so that, in, you know, they said, we're learning how we're supposed to manage a team and hire and fire and design programs and set priorities. So they themselves were, as a, um, a management unit, becoming very much stronger and then were pulling from the PRT some of the funding options. So it's headed the right direction, but again, it, it's nascent. The, you've got really good people who care, and you've got 
some places where there's more capacity and some where there's less capacity. And it's um, being built with both DOD, USAID, and the provincial health um, the teams. Now, again, there was clear evidence that USAID had fewer people than they could um, needed to guide those kinds of programs. So in some of the P um, PRTs, we saw someone with actually USAID person who was the, the go-to development person who had limited expertise and experience and would be guiding on health programs without having very much health expertise. So there was a limited capacity for USAID to be able to man the PRTs in ways that it, they should have <laughs> to guide a process that was starting to be put in place fairly functionally. Let me add to that a little bit, though, because um, you've all heard, I'm sure, of the whole civilian increase and how yeah. they're dramatically increasing the number of yeah. people, the number of civilians that we're sending to Afghanistan. And a huge number of that increased number of civilians are going out outside of Kabul to the PRTs, to district support teams, to regional platforms. And the idea for that is actually to send more um, experts out there, including health including health experts. Because in the past, what we would normally have is in a PRT, you would have one State Department person, um, one USAID person, and maybe a USDA person, Department of Agriculture. And we're dramatically increasing that number, and the idea is to have several civilians in each of these PRTs or DST or at the higher levels, so that you can actually provide that expertise and do more of a coordination. Now, the other thing, though, to, to, to talk about, and again, this is not just in the health sector and might be a little bit better in the health sector because of the way um, the health system is managed, it has been very difficult for the Afghan government to deliver services beyond and to the provincial and the district levels for, for a lot of different reasons, because the money doesn't flow down, because the people in the line ministries don't necessarily want to go to a lot of these places. Now, that's a different issue than the U.S. government sending its own, its own civilians to provide advice and to coordinate you know, between the civilians and the military. But that does remain an issue. Yeah. And we are, um, you know, we, we have to work with the Afghan government, and, and we are, yeah. to try to figure out what to do with that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, Serge Duss with the International Medical Corps. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank all of you for uh, coming and uh, making presentations which are critical, particularly at this time. And my question is about COIN and humanitarian space. Uh, all the donor countries uh, are participating in the uh, U.S.-led COIN strategy in Afghanistan, including the U.S. Development Agency, uh, AID, and it is also requiring NGOs that would like USAID money to contribute to the COIN strategy. And so my question is, how can uh, sustainability in health programs in the Afghan population have any hope of success over the long term when these programs in many ways are being implemented for political and military reasons with a such a large Department of Defense footprint throughout the country. And it's interesting that someone mentioned that the State Department is in charge of counterinsurgency, but I don't see any State Department or AID personnel throughout the country. And it, we understand that. It's the military and, and the way this is perceived by the Afghan population. So at some point, the U.S. will leave and the military will leave, but the NGOs who've been operating there, particularly IMC and many others for the last 25 years, we have no exit strategy. And our credibility is increasingly hurt because of the population's perception that we are aligned with invading and occupying forces. Um, I think I can take a stab at that. Um, uh, well, wait, I'd like, a after perhaps Dr. Anderson and Dr. Peterson are able to answer that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to well, start? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Start. <laughs> I just basically wanted to start by saying this is a concern that we are hearing throughout the NGO community. And um, this is something, obviously, we've been trying to deal with and we are continuing to deal with. Um, and, and I can tell you this was actually a topic of discussion with Ambassador Holbrook just a couple of days ago about mm -hmm. how, how do we address this issue. And the one thing, the quick answer that I would go back to, again, to my simple quick answers, is that um, in 
a lot of these areas where they are truly insecure and you know there there has to be military operations that are going on um, I, I would go back to what you would expect from these programs and, and this discussion actually um, the first time I met one we had um, do our programs uh, can we expect our programs to contribute to stability or what what I was trying to say is to sustain the stability because in many of these places unless you have the security in place it's very difficult for any a lot of these NGOs to actually even get in there and work um, when I was there they were trying to draw a map of some of these NGOs you know the whole red versus green and a lot of the NGOs were not even able to operate and these were NGOs that had been there before so again I would go back to um, you know we're trying to create the space the security for one of these there's some of these to operate and then hoping that our NGOs and other implementers can go in there and at that point do their programming okay well <coughs> first of all let me ask you to get with with Matt right there uh, <laughs> sitting behind Fidette because he has CDs of our new uh, NGO handbook for the military and do you have enough to go around Matt? We have ten. You have ten. Okay, yeah. so first come, first serve. Yeah, uh, no injuries, no injuries in the rush. But um, <laughs> we we uh, we put together uh, through the Jackson Foundation a, a handbook for the military on NGOs. It's about a 400-page handbook actually on how to how to work with NGOs, and it's been getting some pretty good press. So I think that's a that's a kind of a good start, and it, it may actually be helpful to other agencies as well. Um, the, the second thing is that NGOs can become kind of a cottage industry, and you mentioned lack of an exit strategy, and I, I'm a, a huge fan of IMC, and I've never seen uh, IMC trying to feather its own nest mm -hmm. through contracts and stuff, but, but I have seen others do it, and uh, any time a, a host nation government is going to be working through NGOs, then NGOs are going to be springing up like mushrooms in the rainforest to take the money. And, and I think we have to be careful about that because then the Anderson Complexity Index you know, mm -hmm. goes up by another bazillion uh, factor of a bazillion. But um, <laughs> the NGOs have a, um, an, an irreplaceable role in counterinsurgency. The, the problem is the, that that area where they overlap, and I'll, I'll never forget in Iraq in 2003 when we went to the uh, ICRC headquarters and they got all nervous that we were there. And uh, we thought that was a little bit silly of them. And then a, a few mm. days later, some ICRC guys started getting beheaded out there by the Tigris River. So it, it's a real issue that I think we're aware of. On the other hand, uh, if you read the blog Health and Conflict, Conflict and Health, uh, there's a lot of talk there about how the NGOs no longer have a, a an immune position anyway. The, the enemies that we're fighting now uh, have no more respect for NGOs than they do for the Red Cross on a tent, so. Um, uh, not addressing that directly, but I was going to say uh, what it uh, reminded me of is um, that one, another one of the big success stories of Afghanistan is the number of national NGOs and many of the international NGOs have been very instrumental in helping uh, develop, foster, um, partner with them. But um, uh, you know, initially in 2002 and three, when we started contracting, there were international and um, some national. Now it's primarily national NGOs. So, and uh, you know, and they've developed that capacity and that to um, you know be accountable, financially accountable. Um, they have a uh, reason for being there, uh, they're committed in that, so, um, and that's also a role that many of the NG international NGOs have played as well, of helping to foster that development. So I just wanted to mention that, that um, um, I'm not sure if I touched on it, but I think that's another one of the real success stories is that uh, you have Afghans looking after Afghanistan in, in many, many different ways in that. That doesn't mean there's no need for international NGOs. We still have a strong role in terms of uh, capacity development in that, but uh, that capacity is being developed and they're developing their own institutions and civil um, organizations. Yeah. Uh, I would have just three quick points and I'll start a, a follow on here. When we um, were looking at what did we do in the conflict zones, as we first went, everyone said, where the bullets are flying, 
only the military can be there. There isn't any other option. And it's part of the way through our time we said, okay, let's question that premise. Is there anybody else or any other way of bringing health and health services to people who need it in the conflict zones and, and started talking with people about that. And, and basically, if you have people there who need health services, that means you do have people there who could be providing health services. Maybe not easily, but it brings you directly to Afghan um, NGOs or the private sector that is there and looking for and using the capacity that is on the ground, building what there is up to the next level, taking small moments of peace and moving it forward. So I think um, being very creative in some of the relationships with the local NGOs could begin to move some of that forward. On the international NGOs, uh, we gathered a group of them together and very strongly got exactly the message that you were giving, Serge. But as we pursued it longer, basically they got to the same place that Sepeda just said, and that is, you know, we can't go if there isn't security. So we don't like it that there needs to be military, but in fact, oh yeah, actually we acknowledge we do need to have some military presence there. And then the discussion became more, how do we get enough degrees of separation between the military presence and the NGOs so that the NGOs, especially in a doing aid work, are able to go more freely. And that's a slightly different concept. Then you could talk about could money from the OD go through provincial t um, health teams? Could there, there be a contracting from USAID to NGOs? Can there be presence in the DRTs in the surrounding areas, but not right where the NGOs are doing the work. So they began to look at ways that you could get enough degrees of separation between the military and the NGOs and let both do the jobs that they're good at. So I, I think um, if we can get beyond sort of gut reactions and philo philosophical approaches, we could get to some compromises that could work out some good relationships. Thank you for your comments, and let, let me just make one final note. Uh, at the end of the 80s, there was a humanitarian consensus that was negotiated by the UN in Afghanistan that allowed UN personnel and NGOs to be able to work within, within Afghanistan and on border areas of neighbor, neighboring countries. Two questions, and then we'll get the, uh, the panelists will answer both questions. Thank you. I don't want to give short shrift. <laughs> Thank you to a very interesting panel. Um, my name is Emily Levitt. I've been coming and going from Afghanistan for about five years working on maternal and child nutrition work. Um, so I'm not really here to speak so much about nutrition, but um, one thing that I learned on my last trip, and I was working for the World Bank this past year as a consultant on nutrition issues, and what I learned when I was talking to different ministries about how one could integrate maternal child health nutrition into different sectors was that um, in the Ministry of Labor, Social Affairs, um, Martyrs and Disabled, the Social mm -hmm. Safety Net Ministry, what I learned in their policy document was that they said one of the top reasons for desertion and poor performance or showing, not showing up for duty among the military and the police was that there wasn't a strong safety net for the families of the military and the police mm -hmm. and that if something happened to them, if they were disabled, dismembered, killed, that because often women aren't working, there'd be no way to provide for their families. So that was an interesting link um, that I hadn't thought about that occurred to me. I've been trying to figure out what to do with that information as we've been looking at a strategy um, for Afghanistan in general. And I just see that we have a lot of very able-bodied, motivated Afghans who love their country, who are willing to stay there and try to make something work in their country um, for stability. I think much more capable, although we are an elephant, a gorilla, whatever we are <laughs> militarily, than Afghans. People have been comparing us to Vietnam, and I think the geography of Afghanistan is spectacular and incredibly inspiring, but it's complex, maybe similar to Vietnam, and I think Afghans know their geography and how to fight there maybe better than we do, mm -hmm. I'll venture a guess. And I just wonder if we give them the incentives they need to show up and fight that could relate to health and social safety nets, which yes, is economics, but maybe relates to health. Um, might that be a counterinsurgency strategy that we could put more resources into? Because I hear we cost 
$500,000 for every person that we put on the ground. So just a thought. And last, last one. My name is Mohamed Daoud uh, from Voice of America. And uh, by coincidence, I'm also a public health expert uh, from Afghanistan with years of experience there. Uh, I, I first uh, want to uh, refer to the reconstruction of the health infrastructure in Afghanistan, which was mainly done uh, to last seven or eight years by contractors and mainly international contractors. As we are talking about relating uh, the, uh, the development uh, projects in Afghanistan to stability uh, operation. So uh, my idea or my view is that uh, uh, Ministry of Health or the health sector uh, beside the education sector uh, are the two main uh, potential uh, sectors in Afghanistan that the infrastructure development could have been used as a potential means for stability, not, not, not as an end. The reconstruction of the infrastructure in the health and education sectors, which is a huge and it, it reaches out to the grassroots of, of the population mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, these two sectors, the infrastructure rehabilitation and uh, building could have been used as a very great potential uh, means of connecting the people and uh, getting pe uh, community participation and community empowerment through their involvement in the process of reconstruction and ownership of, of these buildings. And as uh, I don't know how it didn't uh, 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 you know, take place and it was not a, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity that was not used uh, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, uh, trust building or for uh, uh, community uh, uh, empowerment. That was uh, uh, my my uh, point mm -hmm. that I want to uh, make. And the second thing I, I refer to the IMC uh, colleagues' uh, 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 point uh, about the NGOs. Uh, what is the main as as under Afghan constitution? The health services is part of the government responsibility to provide for the people. What is the purpose and the criteria that is selected for uh, g giving out uh, health services uh, to the contractors or to the NGOs uh, in Afghanistan? Whether it is the incapability of the Ministry of Health that they are not able to provide health services in certain parts of the country, or is it some mm -hmm. kind of other, uh, uh, you know, a criteria that is considered uh, that uh, sometimes it it uh, it uh, gives a kind of duplication and sometimes gives a kind of uh, duality of of uh, standards uh, in in the health services that the NGOs they are getting better uh, in a support or getting better resources they can provide better health services and the government cannot and that was that was a question that I had uh, uh, about uh, having uh, contracting the the health services to <coughs> the NGOs in Afghanistan and whether it's going to be sustainable. This is what I'd like to ask the panelists to do in, in, in a minute e for each of you to <laughs> answer both questions if you like uh, or either question or neither and make whatever final remarks you would like to make. Uh, and why don't we go in reverse order if we can. To, uh, so we'll start with Stephanie. Or oh, oh, don't you want to? Oh, that, that's fine. Um, <laughs> one minute. Okay. Um, let me um, respond to the police one first. I think great point. And there's a lot of reasons the police are deserting. Part mm -hmm. of it is because they don't get paid enough, they're getting killed more than the ANA is, and part of it is because also they're not getting the services. And, and so uh, there's a lot of discussion currently going on about what kind of training do you provide the police, what, kind of, what do you provide them, how much of a salary you pay. So quick answer, it's an issue, um, but health and that is one of the many reasons why they're deserting, and, and those are some of the things we're looking at. Um, in terms of the second question, I, I think I'll let you answer the NGO because you guys have dealt a lot with it. Um, but relating development to stability operations, I, I, I think again, these are some of the things we're constantly struggling with. And, and this goes back to, you have to be very specific where you're talking about. And, and you know, USAID has actually done this study which we call I think CCAP, which really focuses on what are the drivers of stability in different places. And so, you know, is it health and education that is driving instability? Is it the lack of justice that's driving instability? You can't necessarily go into every place and say, well, if you bring health, you know, these communities are gonna become more stable. Maybe it's dispute resolution. Maybe it's just, you know, really lack of security. And maybe it is health and education. So I think you have to be very specific about that. Now we do talk a lot about, again, sustaining security and stability once you've actually reached some level of it. 
And I think at that point, it really does become important, providing help, providing education. And the example that is constantly given is the National Solidarity Program, because that is one that everyone talks about. There is community involvement. You know, it's the community itself who chooses what kind of programs they want, and they're very, very involved. And I think we are learning a lot from that, and we're trying to apply a lot of those lessons. I have more than one minute. Left. That's fine. Thank okay. you. You were short before. Sorry. Anne? Uh, okay. Um, I think we heard the, um, the economic issue about getting sufficient pay to keep people in their jobs as an issue across the board, <coughs> not just for the police, though it clearly was a much larger problem there. Um, the, one of the other interesting pieces relative to that was the, the police versus the army being a less trusted part of the security forces in Afghanistan and at least a hint that not only economically but the um, issue of drug use in that population could be a factor. Again, that could be a health issue that we could begin to deal with from the, the drug abuse and the mental health perspective and assist the ANA and the ANP to address some of those issues. Um, the only other thing that I thought would be important, at least on the, the contracting out of the health services that was raised, is while it may have been done out of expediency initially in Afghanistan, there are a number of places in the world where contracting out for the government to NGOs has been um, taken on later in the development cycle, and it can be sustainable. It can be the best way to do it, or it can be a temporary um, interim step as you build the capacity of the government itself. So I've been astonished, actually, at the um, flexibility and forward thinking of the government of Afghanistan in rebuilding its health sector in ways that are focused, thoughtful, and creative, and fairly functional, and they're making great progress. One of the fears I would be, um, would have is that we let them go too soon before they are able to really continue yeah. it on their own, and then we would be in exactly the same place as some of the findings that we had. Uh, we've created very high expectations of better health services, and then uh, if support gets withdrawn, there will be a faltering in that you will have people expecting services they even, even less get now, and you increase the dissatisfaction and instability. So I would say we have to very, very firmly hold on to the progress that we've made in health it, as part of the COIN strategy and stabilization. Thank you. Bill, you get the last word. Oh, okay. oh, I didn't, you know, I was looking right past you. Doesn't reflect anything, Butch. No, I, I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> regarding, uh, first of all, regarding the uh, Afghan National Army, the AMP, um, as, as the ANA and AMP ramp up their numbers, every single soldier and every single police officer becomes important because training them is, is very difficult to recruit them, it's very difficult to train them, it's very difficult to retain them, not unlike the American military. And, uh, and uh, beyond that, what I want to say is I agree with you, and if you get with Dr. Mesa Mahmoud sitting back there beside you, uh, we'll continue to work with you in the future, and we look forward to it very much. So thank you very much for your question. Um, the, uh, the second issue, um, I'd like to say that um, everybody in here probably has worked all their lives to get A's on all their report cards, all their transcripts. Every one of you I know is, is, has, I mean, you know, I went through pre-med, so, you know, <laughs> let the guys live a large guy first. But, so I know what pre-med people are like, and you're out there. Um, <laughs> is, it, is it real important that we get an A for, for, for all of our reconstruction efforts? Is it real important that our marks are all A's? Not to me. Um, I, I want to do the best job I can, but I know that if I'm taking calculus or, or quantitative chemistry, quantitative analysis, I'm not going to get an A. It ain't going to happen. But there are other things I'm going to get an A in. And I think that's the same way with DOD. There are certain things that if we're trying to build a hospital system somewhere, I'm, I'm okay with getting a B. When USAID comes in and takes it over, or, or on behalf of the host nation government, USAID comes in and, uh, you know, <laughs> takes it over. 
Um, <laughs> if, if, if they tell us that we got a 84%, I'm just going to be deliriously happy. <laughs> like so. Thank you. Okay, I guess I get last crack. Um, uh, Emily Levitt's comments um, uh, remind me of one thing, uh, not so much reminded me, but an observation. We've been talking about, you know, how do we coordinate amongst the U.S. government agencies. I'd say one gap is there's uh, uh, not much coordination among Afghan ministries uh, themselves. So uh, there's some work to be done there as well. So I was just going to say it's not just us that have a hard time getting this thing uh, together and, and correct. So. Uh, in fact, it's uh, nutrition is one of them, at least within the ministry, where we're starting to work with agriculture and um, uh, the, um, some of the UN agencies dealing with um, uh, food and that, uh, WFO and that. So anyway, so that's just one um, uh, additional bonus comment. Um, the second was what uh, Ann had mentioned, the National uh, Solidarity Fund has been tremendously successful. This is a, a government of, excuse me, a program of through the uh, uh, MRRD ministry where small grants are given to communities to do, with, they have to come up with a plan and it might be a, mi uh, a micro hydro uh, electric uh, one, you know, a little tiny dam or something to give some electricity in the evening hours uh, mm -hmm. for remote villagers or that, but they figure it out and they can get a grant to provide that and then that money, they use local contractors and that to do it. Um, so that's been very successful and I know there's looking at how they can expand that or, or make that, and I, but it's recognized across um, uh, all countries uh, and donors that uh, this has been a very successful program of the Afghan government. Uh, third thing, on, as far as the delivery of services, um, I was in the meeting and I believe it was April of 2002 when the, the Ministry of Health with the donors, the decision was made that um, the Afghan uh, government's Ministry of Public Health would, uh, it's the, um, it oversees, it's the steward of the health sector, but there would not be the recreation of a huge bureaucracy in terms of the government providing the services, actually delivering the services. They would oversee, set the standards, establish what, um, what would happen, what needed to happen, um, but using the uh, mechanism of NGOs to deliver the services rather than creating basically a huge bureaucracy if you had to have all those as um, staff or, or um, employees, civil servants of the government. So that was a conscious decision. It's not something that's just stumbled across or that. And the government was full and parcel part of that decision. So um, I think the, I guess just for a final word, um, I was just searching for, um, I guess, a word. And uh, at least uh, I think for me personally, um, maybe I'll use two words, I guess, uh, and I'm not sure which one to use, promising and hopeful. I, I, you know, we can talk about that, we hear the news and that, but there's so many other things going on, little bits here and there uh, with the different uh, parts of government that are happening and not just in the health sector. So uh, it's not all dark clouds over Afghanistan. There's actually mm -hmm. many good things uh, here and there uh, going on. Well, I think we should thank our panelists, not just for their terrific presentations, but for the work they're all doing. So let's give them a Thank you all.